All right. Looks like it's time to get the show started. Um, I figured I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about my day real quick just to kind of get the ball rolling here and uh, just to give people time to join as well. So thanks so much, everybody who's joined already. Um, great to see you guys here. And uh, I feel free to start asking questions whenever you would like, you know, um, you can just type them right in the comments there and I'll be ready to answer them as we go. And it can be anything wildlife photography related. If you want to talk computer stuff, you know, post-processing, happy to answer those questions. Um, and if it's photography related, I'm going to, I have my Lightroom catalog here, so I'm going to be able to bring up any photos that I think might kind of help illustrate the point or, you know, help answer the story. So I'm going to switch back to that real quick right now and talk about my day, which was really fun. Um, thanks so much, everybody. Uh, oh, good. We got a bunch of viewers already. Excellent. So yeah, welcome everybody. And yeah, every time I'm looking over there, I'm just looking at my other screen just to look at the comments and stuff like that. So that's what's going on there. <laughs> uh, but anyway, yeah, welcome for everybody in the Northeast. I hope you all uh, got to get out and enjoy some of the snow. Uh, that's certainly what I did today, as you can see here. Um, that's all I was thinking of, uh, all day yesterday, it was snowing and on and off rain. So I wasn't able to get out in it yesterday. It was a lot of it during the day was rain and it finally turned to snow like the last, I don't know, maybe hour of the day. And at that point I was just too lazy to get outside and try and do anything. So, uh, I bailed on photographing anything in the snow yesterday, just figured I'd get out today and, uh, see what I could do. So first thing this morning, I went outside. It was still snowing the entire time I was out, but it was real light, so nothing too heavy, so it was real easy to shoot in. And uh, yeah, I just ended up walking across the street. Oh, hey, Anthony, welcome. Uh, yeah, I just ended up walking across the street and photographed anything I could find. And it was all, I didn't get any like cool, you know, unique special birds or anything. It was all mostly just, um, you know, your standard kind of backyard bird stuff that you would find in the Northeast here. But, um, I got to photograph it in the snow and the coolest part about this morning was how there was snow just covering everything. Like every branch was coated in snow and you can kind of see that I'll go through some of these here and um, yeah, definitely uh, start asking questions in the comments. If you guys have any questions either about what I'm talking about now, or if you had another question, uh, as soon as I kind of wrap up talking about my morning, I will get started on those questions. So feel free to leave them anytime. So yeah, I, uh, you know, I started just trying to have fun with these birds and really tried to get creative with the compositions. And uh, for me, it was so fun shooting in the snow, mainly because I rarely get it here in South Jersey. You know, uh, this is the second time all winter so far that uh, I've had some snow here. And the first time was, it was really nice and it was pretty and it covered the ground, but then the next day it was gone. So this is the first time where it's going to be around a little bit longer. I think there was... I would guess there was about a foot of snow on the ground. Um, but yeah, I was really just trying to see if I could do something creative with the snow and what I really wanted to do. And it's what you're looking at here on some of these examples, uh, like this one was sh shoot through some stuff. Uh, that was kind of the important concept that I had in my mind. I really wanted to shoot through some snow. I mean, stuff like this, I think is great and I'm really happy with it. Uh, there's the final edit on that. But, um, I don't know. It's just not as creative and interesting. It's just, you know, it's just bird on a branch. Now it looks better because there's a whole bunch of snow on that branch. So I do still like it. And I think it's more interesting because of that. But um, I don't think it's as creative shooting stuff like that until I start shooting through some stuff. Like really what I wanted to do was incorporate foreground uh, elements. And easier said than done. You know, as you see here, as I'm going through some of these, there's just a lot of them that don't have that. So, uh, this one I thought was really cool, uh, just cause it was had really cool graphical elements. I love the symmetry of these branches sticking up and just the, the pose on that tufted tip mouse. So excellent. Got some questions coming in. Yeah. Keep asking the questions. Uh, I just want to let a few of them build up and then I'll start answering them. Um, Let's see. Yeah, this is the kind of stuff I found more interesting where I was just shooting through all kinds of interesting foreground. And uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun, you know. Um, here's one. There's 
here, let me switch. That's the final edit on that one. This was like the tiniest window. I was actually really amazed that the camera caught focus on this. I put the focus point like on this and it was still overlapping some of the foreground stuff. And then when it caught focus on the bird, I was like, oh yes. And then I got, I think I shot, I shot like four frames and the first one was decent. The second one, the bird kind of like weirdly looked towards me and it didn't fit in that opening that well. And then I think this was like the third or fourth shot where it turned its head back and just gave me a nice profile. And this, I mean, like the opening was just that, uh, there was not a lot to the opening there, which was pretty cool. So, uh, that was a really neat shot. And, uh, I sent this one, I sent a bunch of these out to a few friends and a few of them wrote back that this was one of their favorites. They liked this a lot. So this is another, just a nice little pocket, like a little window through all these branches I was shooting through. And like, this is the cool part about the snow, right? So in a shot like this, if there was no snow on these branches, this would have just been all brown out of focus stuff. And I probably would have seen a lot of these branches and they would have been kind of in focus and distracting and it's just not as nice, you know? So with this, I mean, these branches were really covered in snow. So I was able to get almost everything to just white out, you know? And I think I did, yeah, I softened up some. So there was the edit, like that's out of camera. Um, and then I just kind of lightened up some of those branches to kind of clean it up because there were still a few dark spots like that. So uh, I did do a little bit there to, to just make it a little bit nicer. But, you know, generally speaking, that's kind of how it looked. Um, all right, we got some questions coming in. So uh, let's get started on some of these. I think I talked enough about my day here. So uh, let me switch over so you guys can see me. Somebody just saying thanks for all the hard work. I appreciate that. Thanks so much. Um, how do I go about researching species before I photograph them? Um, yeah, so like an outing like I did today was just go out and see what I could find. I don't do that a lot anymore. So it was really fun. It was enjoyable to just kind of go out and see what I was going to see. Um, most of my research comes from past knowledge, honestly. Uh, almost everything I photograph, it's rare that I photograph a lot of species new right off the bat, you know? Um, if I do, then the research that I'm doing is looking on eBird usually, uh, looking for reports uh, and then learning about their habitat. So, you know, um, looking for reported signs that they were there on eBird in a spot over a period of time. So usually not just like a one or two sighting, you know, I'm looking for um, more sightings over a period of time to let me know that they're pretty established there, whatever that species may be. And let me see if I can bring up some species that I can kind of give an example of. Uh, and usually it's, you know, that like I do more eBird stuff for songbirds and warblers um, for species like, well, I can't say that like this actually was all, um, eBird as well. So like these hooded merganser shots right here, uh, that came from eBird. I was out with a client one day. We didn't have a great morning. We, I hopped on eBird right on my phone while I was out and started searching. I was actually not searching for hooded mergansers. I was searching for pintails. Saw a report of a pintail at this particular location. And then I looked at it on the satellite view on Google maps and it looked like it had potential. It was uh, not too far of a drive. So me and the client drove there, we scouted it out. And then, um, yeah, there was just a ton of hooded mergansers there. So it was just, you know, I, I think on that particular day, I, this wasn't the only spot I scouted. I put like 250 miles in on one day, just driving around scouting, looking for locations, uh, trying to find pintails and other waterfowl and other options to photograph them. So uh, once I found them, then we just went back uh, a couple days later and nailed these shots. It was just absolutely incredible. Um, let's see, let's go. Yeah, let's go to more songbird kind of stuff, uh, from the spring. Cause that's where I do a lot more of that research. Alaska was all, uh, no meeting up with somebody, you know, that, uh, knows the area. So that was all, uh, Jamin Taylor. He, you know, lives there and was able to put me on all those birds. So that was some incredible stuff. Um, but yeah, let's see. I mean, so like, you know, most of these species that you're looking at here are all species, I've photographed before. This is a great example. So this was Maine and I went up there this year, never been before to the area I went. Um, I didn't ask anybody for Intel. Uh, I, I personally, I think it's great. You, 
if you have a network of friends and you can get people to tell you where some stuff is. But uh, for me, it's there's two reasons why I don't. Number one, I just personally like to find stuff on my own. So uh, being able to just kind of do that and go out and succeed and find things completely on my own is just fulfilling for me. Um, I also have the time to do that. So I understand a lot of people don't. Uh, and then secondarily, uh, a lot of these places that I'm trying to find are potential workshops down the road. And so I would never take Intel from somebody else that they gave me a spot and then workshop it. That's just something I would never do. So, um, you know, finding these spots on my own is key. So with this location, I had just done a bunch of eBird research. There was uh, good reports of a lot of species there. And I mean, this was all, let's see. Uh, this is everything from that trip. Like, and this is not everything. This is just what I've shared. So this is just like the good stuff. Uh, but you know, nice variety of species there just, and I went there and just all day long out in the field, walking around, searching, looking for proper habitat for different species and seeing what I could find. All right. Um, let's see. Oh, we got a lot of questions. All right. Let me try and answer these quicker. All right. So that was the first one. Do I ever use a gimbal or a tr on a tripod or just a monopod? Uh, this is Nicole asking this. If I do, which gimbal tripod combo do I have? I do use a gimbal and a tripod mm -hmm. when I'm shooting in a hide. So when I'm sitting stationary, so photographing like the belted kingfisher is a perfect example. Uh, or if I'm standing stationary and doing birds in flight, uh, then I will use a tripod and a gimbal just cause I know I'm gonna be sitting in one spot, not moving. Um, I, the gimbal I have is from the company Movo, M-O-V-O, uh, because I don't use one that often, I wasn't going to spend a fortune on it. So far, it's been great. I've had it for, I don't know, maybe five months, something like that. Uh, but it's been really nice. Seems built really well. Um, you can go to my website and actually just go to, so if you go to rayhennessy.com and go to the frequently asked questions page and then if you scroll down here to the gear list there's a list of everything i use so there's the the monopod the monopod head uh, the tripod i'm using right now is this i guess it's art size uh, is a carbon fiber tripod again i don't use a tripod that much so i didn't want to spend a fortune on it and so far it's been really good uh, so that's where you can check that out all the gear i have listed there all right let's see what do we have next um ba -ba -ba. Yeah, fresh snow does make for a fun day. That's great. All right. Uh, Nicole is, oh, she said she just come across me today. Thanks so much. Welcome. Thanks for joining. And she is asking, what is the camera and lens combo that I use? Uh, the lens I use most often is the Nikon 500 F4. Uh, it's the older version, so it's the heavy one. And I also have a 300 F4 the PF version, it's really lightweight with a teleconverter that I'll use for that. Um, and then I have two cameras now for six years now, I've been using the Nikon D4S and now I just added a, a Nikon Z6 II. So excellent. All right, next questions. Um, okay. <laughs> Someone's telling me that my webcam was on the bird. Sorry about that. It was covering the bird, I guess. <laughs> I guess I can see that now. Sorry about that. Um, was I shooting with the mirrorless? Yes. You know what? All the stuff today I shot with was with the mirrorless. And I got to say, I think the next time I'm going out for songbirds and stuff like that in the snow. So um, let me jump back to just show you guys some of the stuff I shot with that again. But anytime I'm going to shoot stuff like this, it was frustrating. It was missing a lot and it was just really slow. So like all this kind of stuff that I shot uh, today, this was all with the mirrorless. And I mean, when it, I, obviously it works, I did get some really good stuff that I'm happy with, but there was definitely some shots I missed and it was kind of annoying. So I think for this songbird in the forest stuff, it's probably not the best camera. It just doesn't seem quick enough and fast enough. And I think the D4S would have done better for me actually. Um, am I doing any side trips to new locations when I go to Florida this winter? Uh, yes, actually, I think I am. Um, I just talked to somebody that uh, might be doing some uh, searching in and around the Everglades and doing some research around there, a little scouting, see what I can find. And if things work out, maybe put a workshop together for there. And uh, anytime I go down to Florida or any area, usually, as long as I have time, I'm always scouting, looking for new stuff. So um, I will be doing some exploring. But 
it's usually in less known places. I don't go to the big popular parks. Um, again, I just kind of like to find stuff out of the way, a little bit more private. Um, and I don't know. For me, I like finding things that are less popular. So I don't really I, – I tend to not go after the big um, – real popular targets, you know? So great question there. Thanks so much about the Cardinal shot. Uh, Dave says that's what he was looking for, but the Cardinals hate him. <laughs> that's a bummer. Um, all right. What is my favorite warbler? Uh, impossible to say it's whatever one I'm working on currently. It really is. Um, I can say, though, my favorite looking warbler is the yellow-throated warbler. So I'll show you some of those. Let me hop over to some that I've shared. Uh, so they'll be some of my favorites. Hang on. So the computer is a little bit slower when I'm doing this, only because uh, I'm streaming and recording this the screen here. So uh, let's see. Yellow-throated. So, yeah, yellow-throated, I think, are my favorite looking warbler. There's just... There's something about them. I mean, here's a perfect example of just like, I mean, that color pattern on them. Uh, it just To me, it's just mind-blowing. And, uh, yeah, I just really like them. This is one of my favorites uh, that I just, I got real lucky on this one. The light was just right. It landed right in the dogwood there, and just everything was kind of soft and beautiful. But then, again, it's just that striking black and white, that just the overall patterning, and then that yellow throat. Um, something about that this species that just jumps out at me and they're also one of the first returning ones in the area in southern new jersey so we get pine warblers first and then these guys aren't too far behind them so uh they kind of kick off the season for me which is exciting so that definitely um makes me enjoy them more this is like one of those over the top shots i got of that species uh just like ridiculous with those flowers but yeah i just really love the look of them um so I would say I can easily say they're my favorite looking warbler, but then other warblers have really cool behavior. So like Louisiana water thrush are really cool just because of where they hang out. I think it's so neat to uh, photograph them, you know, in and around the water. Let's see if I can spell this right. Yeah, there we go. Uh, you know, and especially to do things like this where you get like, um, you know, motion blur in the water just to do to do long exposures and you know, some of my favorite shots of them are just these like long exposure or uh, I'm sorry, uh, wide angle shots that really show off like the habitat and everything for them. So uh, that stuff is really cool. All right. How much work do I do with birds of prey and how does my approach change with them? I don't do much with birds of prey. Birds of prey are totally a, uh, a bird of opportunity for me for the most part. Uh, the only ones I ever really target in my area are northern harriers, but um yeah, I just, I don't know. I, I guess I suck at finding them or I don't know. I, they also don't really hold as much of a fascination to me as the smaller birds, you know? Uh, so, you know, if I bring up, I mean, obviously you can see here's some birds of prey that I've certainly done some work with. Uh, but this was just, I was there for Northern Harriers. The Harrier didn't show up and the red tail hawk put on a show. So I went with the red tail hawk. Uh, this kind of stuff, this is a photo I shared today and thanks for everybody. I got a really good response on it, but this was the, you know, the target bird. And these are the kind of shots that I love to get of them, you know, a little bit more scenic to showing off habitat. Um, some of the raptors that I got in Alaska, the birds of prey there were, you know, again, birds of opportunity. We were driving by and we saw them, uh, that kind of thing. Um, I'm trying to think of what else I've ever really targeted, uh, this was just like, this was a total opportunity. Yeah. I mean, as I look through these, there's very, very few that I've targeted. Harriers are the only ones that I targeted. Uh, these bald eagles were targeted because uh, I was in a hide with uh, a really good friend of mine who has a, a really nice setup. He puts these, um, he's able to put these deer carcasses out in a field, in a farm field and get the eagles to come in. So that's what all those were shot with. So those were certainly targeted. Uh, but yeah, everything else bird of prey for me. Yeah. I don't try for them a lot. They don't hold quite the fascination for me. So I can't really give you a lot of info on that, uh, because they're probably like my weakest area of expertise with birds. So sorry, I don't have more to answer on that. All right. Could I talk a bit more about my wildlife photography history, how it began in my progression and besides teaching workshops, how can wildlife photographers earn money nowadays? Great question. So I grew up hunting and fishing with my dad, 
was outside all the time. Um, hang on, I'm just going to switch so you guys can see me a little better here. Yeah, I, I grew up hunting and fishing, camping, all that stuff was just outdoors all the time. And then uh, I got into photography right when I graduated high school, but on the digital end of things, I wasn't shooting at all. I just really did the computer stuff. But then while I was working at that particular studio, I started learning more about the cameras and actually learned wedding photography on film, Hasselblads. And then uh, while I was at that job, my dad got a 35 millimeter film uh, Canon Rebel with a kit 70 to 300 and started shooting backyard birds. He was having really fun with it. Then he got a digital camera before I ever owned a digital camera and started shooting the backyard birds. And at that point I was like, Ooh, this is cool. Um, because I've always had a fascination with birds. And then I start, I got my first digital camera and a 70 to 200 two eight lens. And that was the first camera I started shooting wildlife with. And so like here we're looking at right now, my, um, these are all the photos I've ever shared online and social media. So watch, I'm going to go all the way to the end here and start showing you some of these first wildlife pics. And I'm guessing these are going to show just that. Yeah, there we go. So 70 to 200 millimeter. I didn't even have a teleconverter at first. Uh, like if I zoom in, you can see this is a heavy crop. <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, it's only, 1300 by 1900 pixels. Although I think the camera was only 12 megapixel anyway, but um, yeah, I don't even know what camera that was probably like a D 200 or something. Uh, but yeah, it's 70 to 200 to start out with and not good photos at all. You know, um, just, just really bad stuff, but that's what I started with. Then I got a 300 F four Nikon's older version. Uh, it was built like a tank and it was a little slow on focus, but man, was it sharp. Uh, so much better than any of the like other kind of super zoom kind of things that were out at the time. Um, I don't know when that happened. Let's see. This is still 7,200. This one's not that bad. Kind of creative there. <laughs> Must've got lucky. Dumb luck ever happens every once in a while. Yeah. I mean, this is like the, uh, the kind of beautiful stuff I was putting out then. And this is still 7,200. So I shot that lens for a while. Um, anyway, uh, I'm trying to answer this a little bit quicker. Yeah. I, you know, started getting more and more into wildlife and then, uh, got the 300 F4. And then as my wedding photography progressed, uh, you know, I became more of a full-time wedding photographer and then started learning lighting a lot more, a lot more composition from that portrait side of things. And then I started applying that to my wildlife photography. And that's where a lot of my style comes from. The, the more, you know, small in frame, interesting composition, you know, lots of space and, and my eye for lighting all came from, um, that really all came from the portrait work, you know? So, um, that I think is a, an often overlooked aspect of any wildlife photography is that I think you can learn a lot from other aspects of photography. You know, uh, I think there's a lot to be learned from trying different kinds of photography and applying those towards the photography that you really like. So, uh, that answers that question. Uh, besides workshops, um, I make the majority of my money from that, but I don't know if you're good at sales, then maybe print sales. I don't make anything from that, but I suck at marketing myself for that. And I don't really try. Um, I do make some money from, you know, stock sales, but that's minimal. Uh, I license photos and make some from that. Um, basically my suggestion would be if you're looking to make money at it, try to make money in as many ways as possible. So really diversifying and trying to make it from a lot of ways. So I do workshops, I teach online, you know, I teach in person. I have an online class that people can just sign up for and take without me in person, you know, so that's some other income. Um, I work for some bird feeder companies. They send me feeders, I photograph their feeders and then they pay me for the photos. So, you know, I have online, uh, stock sales as well. Um, just any way you can, that's really it. <laughs> uh, it's not easy. It's, it's hard. It pretty much takes up every waking hour of my life right now. And it's been that way for the past year and almost a half now. Um, it's just constant, you know, uh, I'm constantly putting out content, trying to get my name out there and, and get the word out there. So, uh, it's hard, but it's totally worth it. All right. Great question. How do I protect myself and especially my hands from the cold? Um, 
let's see. Oops, sorry, I lost my place there. Just really good warm clothing, really. Uh, waterproof jacket. I have a Gore-Tex jacket. Um, you know, like good snow pants when I went out in the snow today. And I just wear, I don't know, I wear pretty standard gloves, nothing too special. Uh, again, all that stuff's listed, on, most of that stuff's listed on my uh, website uh, under the uh, the gear list section there. I think some of the clothing and, and gloves are anyway. Um, I'm trying to think of what else I have. I have these. These little electronic USB hand warmers. Uh, these things are great. Uh, you just turn them on and off and keep them in your pocket. They keep my hands really warm when they get really cold. So that's something you can check out too. And I think they're linked on my, the website as well. Um, so yeah, I don't know. You really just dress warm, you know, dress accordingly. Uh, if you get really cold, then uh, you probably just need, I guess, better gear, I guess. I, I don't know. <laughs> not, I don't know much more. There's not much more to that. And staying dry is key. So, you know, good waterproof clothing for when you're out in the cold, if you lay on the ground or something like that and you get wet, that can ruin your day. Um, yeah, I have uh, neoprene gloves that I use when I'm shooting at like jetties and beaches and stuff like that in the winter. So that helps keep my hands dry. That's important. Uh, I know I've had some clients have their day kind of ruined when they got their gloves wet and then they couldn't use them anymore when it's really cold out. So that's not fun. Um, all right, let's see what's next. Hang on, just trying to keep track here. Okay. How do I think about, oh, what do I think about camouflage pattern clothing for wildlife? Is it noticeable difference in my approach and have I tried it? Uh, yeah, so the clothing that I wear when I go out, like my heavy jacket, my waterproof heavy jacket, my well-insulated jacket is camouflage. Um, it's got like, I don't know, one of those crazy realistic patterns on it. Uh, for certain birds, it's certainly important, you know, like uh, photographing, let's see, let me hop back here, you know, photographing ducks like this uh, when I'm laying right on the shoreline and having them swim right up to me, if I wasn't wearing camo, I don't think that was happening. Like this duck isn't coming anywhere near me, uh, for walking around photographing warblers. I don't ever wear any camo, you know? Um, but I also know people that do warblers all from hides and I think they have a little bit of a different approach. So, uh, it's very species specific. If it's a tough species to get close to pretty much any waterfowl, anything skittish, like the, uh, the kingfisher that I photograph all the time, um, all that stuff is done in camo you know uh, and then generally speaking like just my winter jacket when I'm out and about and shooting in the cold is camouflage does it help in some circumstances I think so does it not matter even a little bit in others probably I mean I was wearing a camo jacket photographing this uh, this um wow I'm blanking on the species snow bunting on the beach well a wooded camouflage pattern isn't doing anything for me on the beach but it's my warm waterproof jacket so that's what I was wearing you know but it, I don't think it it doesn't hurt, you know? So yeah, shorebirds and stuff like that. I don't ever even think about camo for that kind of stuff, but, uh, for some species and pretty much every duck. Yeah. I'm all about camo. Great question. All right. When shooting through branches, how far away from the branches are you? Are they right in front of you or, uh, are they right in front of my lens or a few feet away? Excellent question. It's different all the time and that produces different results. So, uh, I got two great examples right here. Uh, that I just shot today. So let me bring these up here. All right. So this one here, the foreground was a lot closer, I would say. Um, and so I think it blurred everything out a little bit more. Whereas this one, you can see how there's a little bit more detail and stuff. Uh, this was further away. There was some closer though. Maybe that's not as perfect an example as I thought it would be. Um, basically the closer the foreground stuff is, the more it's gonna blur. And so it's going to, like this was all mostly close stuff and you can see, like see how soft this blur is on the bird right there, um, on the tip mouse? That's because there was like a branch really close in the foreground and it was getting really soft. But if we look at something like, uh, where'd that cardinal go here? This branch was not that far in front of it. This is probably like close, much closer to the bird than me. And so you can see it's a little bit more defined, you know? Uh, so shooting through stuff like that, uh, the closer it is to you, the more it will blur. And um, the further away it is, the kind of more of the texture and pattern you can show of what you want. Uh, so I don't really 
listen, I'm not, I'm not like planning, um, exactly where this bird is going to land. Like when I was photographing any of these today, like bird landed on the branch, I moved through all the bushes and the branches that I was shooting through to find an opening. And I shot, I wasn't like thinking, Oh, I need to move forward. I need to move back. Like this is just what it was. Cause the bird was there for like, I don't know, 15 seconds. If that maybe 30 seconds max. And then it was gone. The most thing I'm thinking about is trying to compose it like this. Like, so that's what I did. Uh, I composed it in camera like this. I don't even think I cropped this at all. Or if I did, it was minimally. Um, so that's the more important thing to me is to just give it the space in the direction it's looking. Uh, but I'm not, I've, it's rare that I have a bird that's cooperative enough that I can kind of change my distance forward or backward. Uh, so it usually is determined by what is there and what's happening. Uh, that usually kind of is the factor there, but great question. I think it's cool to do both by the way, you know, shoot some closer, some further away. All right. Sorry about that. My streaming software just crashed, but it should be back now. Hopefully you guys are getting this. Um, hang on. I'm just going to confirm real quick that it is live again. So just bear with me one second. Boy, it was going so well. Everything was working flawlessly. I think I'm back to live again. Yep, looks like we're good. All right. So, sorry, I lost my place and then the software crashed. Let me just get back to where I was. Um, oh, yeah, equipment for recording better audio when making wildlife video. Uh, yeah, um, a really good shotgun mic is helpful and no wind. <laughs> uh, that's a really important thing. You know, wind kills so much of my sound. Uh, but I gotta say most of the audio that you're seeing in my uh, videos is from other times, you know, not exactly when I recorded it. Um, and if anybody can in the comments, just let me know. Oh yeah. They said it's live again. All right, good. All right, cool. Thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to confirm before I start kind of talking about everything. Um, yeah, I will say, hang on one sec. I'll grab some more gear and show you um, what I did just get to try and do better audio. How convenient that I have all of my gear right here, huh? Let's see. So uh, I just got a, I haven't actually really used it much yet. I only tested it and it seemed to work really good, but I did just get a, uh, a microphone blimp for the shotgun mic that I have. So I'm really anxious to try that out and there you go. So it's this really large kind of device and the microphone goes inside of it. And it's kind of the only way I've read and researched that is really good at kind of masking the wind. But Imagine that mounted on your camera. Have fun with that. <laughs> so yeah, it's not gonna be real portable and easy to run around with. Um, yeah, uh, but audio is really tough. I spend almost more time and sometimes more time doing the audio for my videos than I do actually editing the video. Uh, so if it's just, it's tough, it really is. All right, moving right along. Um, I love the drama series you shared today and was wondering how you achieve the dark backgrounds, uh, the black looking skies in these shots. Uh, none of them are sky. Uh, as you can see right here, uh, here, I have a bunch of them because this particular outing was a, a great example of that. So um, let me show you these with, uh, well, here, actually, let me show you one that's front lit a little bit more. This is probably a good example. Yeah, there we go. This is a great example. All right, so I'm gonna hop into develop here real quick and show you. So let me reset. This is the edited version in Lightroom. I haven't gone into Photoshop to tweak it up, but there you go. That's straight out of camera. That's exactly what it looks like. So here's the deal. Uh, this is the edit I did in Lightroom, so I just darkened it a little bit more. You expose for the bird, that's it, all right? But the lighting is the, the the key to it and it's the direction. So the sun was coming in strong from the left here and this entire background was completely in shade. And so the water line, like watch, if I brighten this up a bunch, you can see like, here's the water line back there. Um, that's like the shoreline, I should say. 
And so the rest of this is just like from here down is all just reflected water. And from here up is the background. It was a dark background and it was in shade. The sun was not hitting that background at that point. It was only hitting the bird. So when I expose for the bird, um, then the background goes black. That's it. You know, sun on bird, background and shade. That's what gives you that black background. Uh, and it's, I mean, the majority of what I do with these is usually birds on the water, actually. Uh, I do have some examples of other birds that I've done that with. Um, I'm trying to think. I think I did it with a, uh, a chestnut-sided warbler, uh, but it's the same exact concept. Uh, it's just for whatever reason, um, waterfowl and just birds on the water seem to make it possible more often. Uh, I don't run into this lighting scenario very often outside of shooting waterfowl, but this is an example. So uh, and this was actually not even really sun on the bird so much. Uh, this was just, it was much brighter in an open area, and then the background was totally in shade. So I just found a really nice dark background. This one was a great example of sun. And uh, this one I do remember is pretty much this out of camera. There were some little green areas that were showing up back there that I just kind of blacked out in post. Uh, but for the most part, same thing, exposed for the bird the birds getting hit by the sun background is black <clears throat> all right uh let's see next question you guys are doing some great questions thanks so much for all this um that was the drama one i'd love to hear how uh your thought process oh i'm sorry here we go i'd love to hear how your thought process changes when shooting in snowy conditions versus something like a cloudy rainy day since the same key seam can appear vastly different. Hmm. The difference between snowy and something like a cloudy or rainy day, um, not much changes really. Uh, snowy day is overcast and cloudy and rainy days are overcast. Uh, I can do kind of the same thing in overcast light that I can in snow, which is just to kind of go high key with it. So uh, here's some bufflehead examples that have that uh, that high key look. Here's a great one. Actually, there's a couple of them here. So uh, this is because it was calm and on the water. I it was, This was just overcast, you know? There, there was certainly no snow. In fact, this day there was a little bit, like the tiniest bit of sun coming through in some soft clouds early in the morning. But yeah, I just exposed for the bird. The water goes white and gray, or like it goes like a bright gray. And then I just make it a little bit more white in post, you know, just kind of punch up those whites with some contrast um, in post. But yeah, it's pretty much the same approach, you know, uh, exposed for the subject and let the background go light. Um, I've done, I've done high key with some birds too. Uh, let me search out for high key here. See what comes up. Yeah, so, you know, other overcast scenarios like this are just a, like a white sky. So, same thing, just exposing for the bird. Like, this is this is pretty much the exact same thing as shooting in snow. So, um, my approach doesn't change at all. It's just all about exposing for that bird and uh, letting the background go white. The one thing that snow can do that just simply overcast lighting conditions can't do is kind of that foreground blur, you know? Uh, so, like this example. So you know, getting like all this white in the foreground here, whereas this would have been like, you know, brown sand because it was on a beach um, because there was it had just snowed and covered the beach and made the beach white. I was able to get the foreground to go white. So it makes more of a high key image because of the snow, like because you can get foreground blur, whereas you tend to not be able to get that with a, um, you know, without snow. So that's kind of a cool thing. Uh, or if you're on a really light sandy beach like this, you can go a little bit more high key with everything. Uh, but yeah, it's always the same thing. It's exposed for the subject and then let the background go white and then try to pump it up white a little bit more. So great question. How do I organize my Lightroom catalog so all my photos are easier to find? Great question and it's simple. It's right here. Look at this section right here, the keywords. It's that simple. So uh, here's some of the photos. In fact, here, I'll show you. Here's the previous import, uh, all the photos from today. And so if I click on any of them, all I've put on there is the keyword for the species. And then this keyword is for my own personal organizational stuff. But yeah, uh, so I just put on here, you know, wild turkey. Here's song sparrow. Um, you know, this gets Carolina chickadee. So there, just like that, they're all searchable. So 
if I go up here to all 78,000 photos and uh, I'm just going to click on the text search right here and let's search for Cardinal. I'll just type that in and the photos that from today, here we go, these are all from today with a Cardinal in it will show up and then, oh, I got to put Northern Cardinal in to show just Northern Cardinal. There we go, change this to keywords, and then there we go, Northern Cardinals. So just like that, all Northern Cardinals that I've shot ever, you know, uh, are in my Lightroom catalog, and boom, they come right up just like that. So really easy to find them, it's super simple, just add the keyword on there. Uh, that's one of the things I talk about a lot in my online Lightroom photography course, is just how to organize stuff. Like you see how fast I'm finding everything, and and I can just kind of bounce around and jump from one photo to the next and go exactly what I'm looking for. Uh, that's just from, there's a few other things you can do to help organize it. And I cover all of that in my online Lightroom course and just show you exactly how I break down everything. But the main thing is simply that, just put that simple keyword of the species on there. Great question. All right, let's keep going here. Um, Ray, let's see, have you ever done darkroom work, color or black and white? Ah, great question. I did it. Let's see, I did play with a dark room once or twice when I was in high school. Um, didn't really like it, wasn't for me. And it was all, it was just black and white. Um, yeah, for whatever reason, I didn't really like the process. And that was it. Oddly enough, my dad, like when I was really young, I think, had like a dark room in the basement kind of thing and, and all that stuff he had in larger and all that. Um, never did that with him. And I think by the time I was old enough to even understand it, I think he had kind of like faded off of that and wasn't doing so much anymore. And he didn't get into photography again until I started working at a photography studio, actually. Um, but yeah, have, haven't done any of that dark room stuff. And uh, yeah, interesting. Uh, just never appealed to me. Even though I did try it, it just wasn't fun. I don't know. It's too much work. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, next question. Uh, am I doing workshops in Florida? Yes, I am. Uh, I will be in Florida. Let me look at the dates right now. I'll be in Florida from, let's see, March 22nd through March 7th. I'm sorry. February. Oh, wait, wait. Let me look at these dates again. Here we go. March 22nd, that was correct, through April 7th. That's it. So I'll be there uh, a little over two weeks. I have open for workshops. Um, I'm going to be down there a little bit longer, but just spending some time with family and stuff. So uh, I'm not doing workshops for every one of those days, but anywhere between the 22nd and April 7th. Uh, so end of March, beginning of April, I'm down in Florida. I'm going to be uh, uh, right now I'm only accepting workshops. I'm only going to be doing them on the East coast of Florida. So yeah, if you just go over to, to my website here, go to workshops, look for, I think if you just go to the winter workshops here, so go to the anytime workshops and then down here for winter. Oh wait, I got to show you my screen. There we go. All right. So you're going to go to workshops, go to the anytime workshops, go down here to winter. And then if you just scroll down, here's some of the Florida options. So um, you can kind of ignore these dates because I just haven't had a chance to update them. Uh, but uh, that's an option. Royal Turns, The Shrikes, Scrub Jays, not Ducks. Uh, and I'm not doing, I, I already have my uh, Burrowing Owls day, Burrowing Owl days uh, booked up. So, um, but I do have some really fun stuff. Uh, spoon bills is something that I don't have on here, but we can totally do that. Uh, some really fun spoon bill stuff. Um, and you can also find it, I think under the, uh, like the all day workshops. Uh, if you go to, uh, no, I don't have it there either. Sorry. Yeah. I got to update those, those dates. Cause, uh, everything, my schedule got all messed up this year, but anyway, great question. Thank you. Um, next up. While you scout, do you have your camera in your hand or only binoculars? Uh, that's a great question. If there's lighting that's possible to make a good photo, then I'll bring my camera with me. But whenever I'm scouting, I usually just bring the real lightweight setup. So the, the 300 F4 and the teleconverter on it. Um, but, you know, if it's like full on bright sun, middle of the day, light's going to be harsh. I'm not bothering bringing a camera. I'm just going to go walk, you know. Uh, it, there's just really no point and it's just kind of extra stuff that I need to drag along that isn't necessary. Um, and that's kind of my favorite time to scout actually is when the light is the worst, uh, because then I don't feel like I'm missing out on photo opportunities. It's like, well, what else am I going to do right now? Um, 
Although recently, I will say, like these these kinds of photos right here, uh, I was really happy. I figured this out. This was taken smack in the middle of the day. So like one o'clock on the, in the in the middle of a full sunny day, the worst light possible can still make some cool photos sometimes. <laughs> so, um, but that's that was a very specific specific circumstance and not one that I think will happen real often. So, um. Oh, you know what? I just happened to see who is my favorite Indian photographer and why is it him? Santosh uh, Shanmuga is asking that. And, dude, it's because you're Santosh, man. That's it. <laughs> it's an obvious answer. <laughs> great, great, great question. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Next question. How many hours a day on average do I go shooting or scouting? Uh, it's all over the place. It really is. Um for the past today was the first day I've gone out and shot in I think I don't know five six days something like that let me see let me look at my uh my dates here oh because I think this was just feeder stuff if I'm not mistaken yeah so that was so that didn't count so oh yeah and I did have a workshop on the 30th so that got me out so that was that was work uh, but I'm trying to think like the last time I shot for myself, that was feeder stuff there. So from January 24th until today. So what's that? That's like a good solid week, right? I don't know. When was the 24th? Yeah, it's like eight days, nine days. Um, I didn't go out and do anything. I just wasn't in the mood. You know, I just wasn't feeling it. Uh, I had had this amazing day right here and then, uh, yeah, I don't know. The next few days I kept waking up and just, I don't know, was lazy. There was a few times where I was like, set the alarm, woke up. I was ready to go out and scout. And I woke up and I was just like, ah, I don't feel like it. I'm staying home. And But when I stayed home, I did work like crazy. So I was doing all kinds of, you know, editing and getting stuff on the website and videos and stuff like that. So it's not like I didn't work. I just wasn't in the mood to go out. So I'll have periods of time like that where I don't go out much at all to do any scouting or shooting. Um, and there's other times where I have a lot of work in the, in the studio here to do or in the office, I should say. Um, but uh, then there's other periods of time where I'm out a lot, you know. I, it's all over the place. There is no average at all. It really is all over the place. It depends on the time of year. It depends on my mood, my frame of mind, what I have going on back here, how much post-processing stuff I have to do, how many videos I have to edit that are like sitting and waiting, uh, stuff like that. So uh, right now I'm totally caught up on all of my editing. So you can see like my, my whole section over here, my workflow section is empty. That's because I'm caught up on all of my editing. So that means I'm ready to do more shooting. Um, so when that happens, I'll probably be out shooting more, but there's some days I'll go out shoot in the morning and then be done, you know, three, three hours, two, three hours. Uh, and then I'll get back here and do more work back at the office. Um, then there's other days where I'll take the whole day, you know, and just go out and shoot like this particular day was one of those kind of, uh, this was one of those, like, just go shoot and get back. You know, like, I think we shot for an hour. I was home by 10 o'clock, you know, and done uh, with shooting. But then other days, um, I'm out all day, you know, uh, this today I was out for like three hours wandering around, um, on i'm trying to find one of these days there was one day that i was just out all day yeah this this particular day right here when i did all this fun like uh silhouette stuff i shot from sunrise to sunset that day so i was out all day um so it really depends it's all over the place let's see do i have a minimum starting shutter speed for bird in flight uh that's a great question um, I guess my go-to bird in flight shutter speed would be like a thousandth of a second, you know, but if it's brighter, of course, I'm going to crank it up more. And if it's lower, I'll go lower. Uh, so let's see, let's look at some shared photos here and let me just find some real quick and let's see if we can figure this out. Uh, I think it's going to be a little all over the place as far as shutter speed goes. So here's lots of birds in flight. And let's take a look at some shutter speeds, shall we? This is the best part about Lightroom right here. Look at that. Uh, the 20th of a second, that's just going to be a pan blur. But there we go. 500th of a second, 640, 800, 1,000. You know, so there's what? 
two photos at 640th, one at 500th. Let's see. I think this is a Harrier. Yep. There you go. Harrier. 500th of a second. There's 640th. 800th of a second. Uh, so, you know, you can totally get sharp shots at 800th of a second and these other shutter speeds. Uh, oh, flight. Haha. I was flying. Not the birds. <laughs> I'm like, wait, why are there landscapes? <laughs> it's because I searched for flight. Uh, so that was a thousandth of a second. So not a lot of a thousandth of a second, but I know it's a shutter speed I'll go to quite often. 1250, 1600, two thousandth of a second. It's getting a little bit more. Um, so yeah, I didn't total over, but yeah, I would say like for me in my head, if I'm just going to start shooting and it's not that bright, I'll go to a thousandth of a second, but I don't know. I don't ever really have a go-to anything other than my aperture. I love F4, so I just pretty much shoot wide open all the time. But outside of that, I don't have a go-to anything. There's no go-to ISO, really. Um, there's no go-to shutter speed. It really is all dependent upon the situation, you know, the subject and what the light's providing. So, you know, in this circumstance, I was able to get, you know, 400 ISO at 3200 of a second. Now, you know, technically I could have dropped my ISO to 200 to get that a little bit lower and cut the shutter speed in half at uh, 16 hundredth of a second, which should have been plenty to stop the action. But the difference between 200 and 400 ISO is somewhat negligible in the quality of the file. So I stayed at 400 and let it go higher, you know. Uh, so that was my thinking in that particular uh, circumstance. Uh, da, da, da. Let's see. Next, what is your favorite urban wildlife work? Um, I haven't done much at all. I only just started and I wasn't able to get a lot. Uh, let's see. I have a couple of them right here. I think set aside. I don't think I've shared any of them yet. Uh, but this was just like from one particular outing that I went out and I went into Philadelphia and did some, some shooting. So here, I'll bring these up. Um, uh, that's yeah so that's the edited version of that just kind of darkened out those bricks but so i don't know i thought like some of these were kind of cool but i don't know they're not i'm not in love with them uh they're not exactly what i was looking for but it was fun you know you get some like cool interesting textures patterns i think it's neat to incorporate stuff like this like i you know was trying to include the the road sign there with the house sparrow and uh things like that um these grates and lines were pretty cool on this one like with the fence same thing here, you know, silhouette where there's like a box truck driving by and, you know, just like cool graphic patterns and stuff like that. So that was kind of fun, but uh, I want to do more of it. I really do. Um, just haven't had the time. I do this full time. I don't have enough time. <laughs> it's crazy how that works. Uh, let's see. How many gigs do... I use for my library or am I using external drives? Uh, great question. Let's find out. I have no idea how many gigs. So uh, let's see. It's split on two drives. I know that. So let's see. Uh, my current working folder right here is this drive. So that photos folder right there. So that's 202 gig there. And then uh, let me bring up my other hard drive. Do, do, do. All right, so what I say? Oh, no, 95 gig for that folder. Okay, yeah, that seems more right. It was 200 before I deleted a bunch of stuff. And then this one. So there we go. Um, so 890 gig there, another 100 gig there. So about a terabyte for all of my photos. So 78,000, what was the number? Yeah, 78,000 photos on a terabyte. That's about it. You don't need a lot. Uh <laughs> My cameras are lower resolution than most, I think. Um, the camera I was shooting until recently was only 16 megapixel. The one before that was 12 megapixel. So for the past decade, I've been shooting at most a 16 megapixel camera. Uh, the camera I'm using now is a little bit higher at 24 megapixel. So that's what the Z6 II is. So that those files are starting to take up more space, uh, which is why I did recently upgrade. So uh, my Lightroom catalog and so there's my Lightroom catalog and just the current photos. So like the last uh, month or I don't know, let me see how far back this goes. Um, yeah, from October until now, uh, October of last year until now is on this particular drive. Uh, this is a two terabyte drive. So I have plenty of space to store it all on here now. But before I was running a one terabyte drive, 
Um, that's for just the photos. So I guess if I include the Lightroom catalog in that size, then it does kick up a little bit more because the, the previews uh, and that kind of stuff take up space. But yeah, um, not a lot. You know, I could fit all of my photos and the catalog and everything on a two terabyte drive if I wanted to. Excellent question. Do I have a shot that really depicts some environmental impacts that are shocking or impactful for conservation? I do actually, and it's getting ready. I'm gonna, I just scheduled it to be shared recently. Uh, and let me look it up for you. Hang on. Come on computer, you can do it. I'm just hoping the uh, streaming software doesn't crash again. That was a bummer. It seems like we're working well right now though. So yeah, there you go. Check this mess out. Osprey caught a fish that is attached to the fishing line, which is attached to a balloon that these fishermen use for floats. So instead of using like standard, I guess, fishing floats uh, at this particular place when I was there, which is down in Florida, it's like a jetty, an inlet, uh, tons of fishermen there. And there was tons of them using these balloons, which, you know, the lines break all the time. Um, these balloons have to be just littering the water in addition to all the fishing line and all the other you know, just fisherman junk. Um, I, it was just, it blew my mind when I saw it. I was like, at first I saw one like balloon. I'm like, oh, that sucks. There's a balloon in the water. And then I see another one and another one. I'm like, wait, are they, and it took me a minute. And I realized I'm like, oh, these fishermen are using balloons as floats. And I was just, I, I mean, I think I was standing there like that, just like, like speechless, like how horrible to just be throwing all this like balloon waste into the water, you know, cause you know, what happens, you know, the line breaks or just the balloon comes off or who knows what. Uh, and then, yeah, this happened like this Osprey caught the fish and I'm watching it fly away, towing the balloon and the fishing line going all the way back to the fisherman. And then finally it got to the end of his line, I guess. And it finally, uh, it, I guess it, it like stopped and the uh thankfully the osprey dropped the fish uh, i was hoping like hell that the line wasn't going to break and then the osprey was still going to have the fish with the line and the balloon and the hook and all that stuff but the osprey in this case dropped the fish and so um you know thankfully at least for that opportunity it got away but yeah i was pretty appalled at that one and yeah i'm going to be sharing that and you know that's another thing that that happens there all the time so uh fishing line let me see i think i have a, a few other photos yeah these are all like both of these so here's a, a royal turn with a hook in its leg tangled up with fishing line bird seemed okay it was flying around and here's a sanderling uh with fishing line all wrapped around its leg all three of these photos with the fishing line all taken at the same place over a period of three years it's just it's a bad place. You know, there's just, it's very popular for fishing. And unfortunately this is the kind of crap that happens there. So it's sad to see, and I don't know what could be done about it. You know, it's fishermen doing their thing. So, but it's a bummer. Um, but it's certainly something I'd like to think more about uh, with the conservation stuff. And I gotta say, I'm just, I'm completely, not completely ignorant. I shouldn't say that, but, um, I'm pretty ignorant of a lot of issues and just kind of slowly learning them myself and trying to expose myself to more of that stuff and think about it a little bit more. That's only something I've been doing recently. So, um, I, I have a very long way to go with that and a lot to learn, but, um, you know, I think our images, you know, all of us photographers, our images can be used in a kind of a powerful way to, to share something like that and kind of bring attention to, you know, some of these, unseen things that maybe people either don't see or it's not in their face enough to kind of care about, you know? So a uh, great question though. How do I set up my dodge and burn quick action layers in Photoshop? A uh, great question. So let me pop an image open in Photoshop. All right. Hang on one second. Let me bring my palettes over here. All right, so uh, you simply go to your actions palette here, and then you're going to make a, a new action, which I guess, oh, wait, I have to take it out of button mode here. Yeah, you're just going to hit the plus icon down here, make a new action, and record it. So, like, here's my dodge layer right there. It's make the adjustment layer, fill it with uh, black, I think it is resets the swatches and automatically selects the brush tool for me. So I'm ready to paint. 
And uh, I think when I make the adjustment layer, it also automatically names it Dodge and it includes the adjustment in it. So uh, I have that and then you double click it and assign it a function key. So Shift F2. So watch, if I go back to the layers palette here, let's say I want a Dodge layer right there. Boom, I hit Shift F2. Oops, that was a burn layer. Command F2 is my Dodge layer. And there it is. And look, look, I'm ready to like Dodge away, you know? So it's that simple. Uh, and then, yeah, my burn layer is Shift F2. So I hit Shift F2 and I get a burn layer and there you go, all ready to go. So nice and easy. All right, let's see what we got next. Thank you so much. Not a question, but I appreciate it. <laughs> um, let's see. For the best telly first... Oh, uh, sorry. Um, for the best tele... I'm guessing they're asking the best telephoto lens for beginners. Uh, I say go with one of the um, smaller quick primes. Um, I don't know what uh, Sony has, I think a two to 600, which I think is really, really good. Uh, I would say go for that. Canon, Canon's a little tougher. Canon doesn't have a new cheap -er prime lens that I know of. Uh, I don't know if, listen, any Canon shooters out there that know, please let me know. But like, I don't think they have like a four or 500 prime that is newer. They have an old 400, five, six, which is an amazing lens, but you know, it's a little dated with no VR, like no uh, IS, I should say for Canon, no stabilization in, on the lens. Um, but it is lightweight. It's reasonably priced and incredibly sharp and incredibly fast. Good for birds in flight. It's a five, six lens, uh, for Nikon, I would say a starter would be the, the 500, five, six PF. Um, if you want to go a little bit cheaper than that, you could do the 300 PF with a teleconverter, the 1.4. Uh, but I would totally say, excuse me, I would totally say save up and get the 500 uh, PF. Uh, that would be a good, a great starter lens. Outside of that, any of those super zoom lenses, uh, I know they're cheaper, you know, Sigma, Tamron, um, and they give you, you know, some of them give you the 600 millimeter reach. I don't think you need it. Uh, the, the reach, I should say, and there's a lot of limitations on those lenses. Um, if that's all you can afford, then then by all means get it. But the other thing to think about is go use too. You know, look for used copies of these lenses out there. Um, a bunch of my gear I have is used. I have a used camera, used lens, uh, so you can save a lot there. That's definitely another way to go for a beginner. All right, next up. Thanks for the great answers. You are very welcome. Thanks for joining and thanks for the questions. What was the single biggest thing that elevated my post-processing skills? Who, um, learning layer masks, learn that. Yep. Learn layer masks inside and out. That would be it. That's, I think the biggest, that's the biggest part of what I do with my editing. Uh, that being said, my editing skills and the speed that I do them and the way that I do them were kind of honed and, you know, I, I kind of, got better at them over a very long period of time. So what, it's 2021 now. So I've been working in Photoshop, you know, I, I can't even tell you how many days a month. Yeah. You know, on average I'm in Photoshop still, I'd say for probably 20 years now I've been, I've worked in Photoshop almost every day, <laughs> you know? Uh, and when I worked for other companies, I was working in Photoshop 40 hours a week or more. Uh, so that was like the minimum and just editing photos all day long. Uh, that's what got me to where I am right now with Photoshop is just working at it constantly for a very long period of time. Uh, Photoshop is a crazy big program. There's a lot to it and it takes a while to get good at it. And then it takes even longer to get fast at it. Um, thankfully, because I have had that much time and experience doing it, that's what allows me to do, you know, all the real time edit videos that I put out. Like that's, that's the speed I'm doing it at, you know, uh, hence the name real time. So, um, you know, almost all of my edits, I just recorded six of them the other day, pretty much every one of them was under 10 minutes, you know? So I don't spend that long every once in a while. I'll have a photo that I'll spend, you know, 15, 20 minutes on, uh, if I spend a half hour editing a photo that I'm, that's a long one. Then there's very, very few times that happens for me. Uh, but I also recognize that I do this stuff a lot faster because I've had literally two decades of experience working in Photoshop all day. So, uh, spend a lot of time with it, just like anything, you know, you spend enough time with it, you get really good and really fast. But, uh, the one thing I would say, learn masking. That's the most important thing. So great question. 
glasses versus, versus contacts while shooting? Great question. I wear glasses to see my screen. Um, I see sharper with them. I wear glasses just pretty much all day, but I can thankfully see well enough without them currently uh, to still shoot. So I don't wear glasses at all when I shoot because, oh, it's horrible. You know, I absolutely can't stand the few times I used to wear them when I shot weddings and that was horrible, let alone wildlife with the positions I'm getting myself in and the, just the, the way I'm like, you know, laying around the hot, hot weather, cold weather, sweating, you know, steaming up the glasses, forget it. I, if my vision, I shouldn't say if, when my vision gets bad enough that I'm going to need glasses to be able to shoot, uh, that's when I'm probably going to really look into getting contacts, but I also have never worn contacts, so I don't know. Uh, I would hope they would be better, but man, I can't imagine trying to shoot out in the field with glasses on. That would suck, because uh, the when I used to do it for weddings, it sucked. Great question. <laughs> I like that. It's just all over the place. Nice. All right. Um, how do I film through my viewfinder with my DSLR and mirrorless? Uh, with the DSLR, I had a rig that would hold my phone up to the viewfinder. And so the camera on the phone right there would just be held right up to the viewfinder on the DSLR. That's how I would do it. It always looked pretty kind of hokey. You know, it was never really that clear or that good. So I never liked that. And now with the mirrorless, it's really great. You just plug in an HDMI cable and an external recorder. I use a, a Ninja, uh, it's an Atomos Ninja V or Ninja 5, I guess. Um, and yeah, it's just really cool device. Here we go. I shall show you. Yeah, it's this really cool uh, little screen here. It's got a, a solid state hard drive that actually goes in there. Uh, big old battery on the back there. And yeah, you just uh, plug in HDMI right there. And then it has an interface to allow you to record to this uh, solid state drive on the back. And it records the viewfinder. It's pretty sweet. Absolutely love it. Um, I will say all these things sound really neat and fun, but actually in practice shooting these things in the field with all these contraptions. So I have that, I have another camera hooked up. I have microphones and audio equipment hooked up. It is a nightmare to shoot. Uh, it makes shooting way more difficult. So if you care about getting the best shot, then do not do any of this because it, you will miss shots hands down. You'll miss shots. You'll lose shots. You will uh, just not be able to get opportunities when you're doing this. So, you know, all these um, behind the scenes videos I put out uh, there, I have to pick and choose what I'm shooting. You know, today I was out for three hours. It would have been great to do a behind the scenes video out in the snow and everything, but um, none of this gear is waterproof and I have not figured out how to uh, cover it all to make it waterproof. So I couldn't hook up any of that stuff and take it out, you know? Um, and if I had, there's a good portion of the shots that I took today I wouldn't have gotten because of how much gear I would have been carrying around and dealing with and fumbling with. And um, when I do a behind the scenes video, I have to hit record on three different devices before I even start trying to think about taking a photo. So um, it's certainly cool. I really like what I'm doing with it and I think it's really fun. But, you know, if you think you're just going to kind of get some stuff and go out and shoot like you always do, it's certainly not the case. So I uh, just wanted to mention that. All right, next question. Do I ever use decoys for ducks or geese? Uh, I use decoys all the time for ducks, not geese. Haven't done, I haven't done any uh, goose decoys, but um, uh, these bufflehead are the, actually bufflehead are really all I've decoyed so far. Um, I have green wing teal decoys, but I have not found a spot consistent enough to photograph them yet. But yeah, every time I photograph bufflehead, like all my bufflehead photos here uh, are all decoys. So um, it's great because I photograph them in a really large bay. And so it's just massive. There's hundreds of ducks out there. There's probably thousands of ducks out there, bufflehead. But it's just massive. It's miles of space. Uh, and so to get them to come anywhere near you, like if you're just going to patiently wait, uh, it's certainly possible, but you're going to be waiting hours with maybe getting to them to pass by. Uh, whereas the decoys, it's great. It brings them in, uh, but it's really cool. I've had, I've had people ask me, they're like, oh, isn't that a little unethical? Um, I think if you saw how it's done, there's nothing unethical about it. The ducks like swim by, they're like, oh, I'm curious. They'll swim by every once in a while. I'll have a male fly over cause he's kind of uh, doing courtship behavior. So he'll fly over to check things out. And then within like, I mean, usually within a minute they they realize like, 
oh, nothing's alive here or something's off. And then they just swim away. Like that's the extent of it. So usually what happens is they're out there feeding they'll swim in because there's some decoys there and then they swim away. Big deal. You know, like I haven't done, I, I don't think I'm harming them even a little tiny bit. Uh, it doesn't really do anything harmful to me. So I think it's great. It's fun and it works great to get some really cool shots of these ducks, but yeah, it does work. All right. Next up. Let's see. I'll try and get through. We got a few more here. I'll try and get through these quick and then we'll wrap it up. Cause I know it is getting a little long here. Um, do I shoot on manual? And if so, what is my go-to shutter speed for birds on branches? Um, I do shoot on manual uh, when I'm photographing birds on branches. That usually means I'm in a forested area and then I use aperture priority with auto ISO, at which point my go-to shutter speed is 500th of a second at the minimum. Uh, but because it's aperture priority, uh, quite often the shutter speed goes higher than that. So uh, it's really all over the place there. Um, if I were to go down to, let's go back to spring here and check out some warblers. There we go. That's kind of a uh, springtime stuff right here. And let's bring up the shutter speed. All right, I went a little lower there. Oh, cause I was on the 300 millimeter. Um, so I could get away with a little lower. So, oh, and I will go lower, uh, but my go-to shutter speed, this was really early in the morning. It was dark, so I was at 250. Uh, but once there's enough light, my go-to shutter speed is 500th of a second. And watch, I say that, I'm probably gonna like prove myself wrong here. That was raining, it was really dark. That was brighter, uh, but this is a great example. So this was aperture priority. And because there was more light, uh, the camera just gave me a higher shutter speed. And that's what happens all the time. You know, that's the beauty of aperture priority is when there's more light and it's brighter, it'll just kick it up for you. Look at that 2,500th of a second. I didn't have to set it there. The camera did it for me, which is great. But yeah, um, there you go. 500th of a second, uh, 500th of a second, 500. Yeah. So you'll see, I certainly will notice a lot at 500th of a second, uh, when, um, when I'm looking through a lot of my warbler photography, you know, cause that's what I set it at. I set it to kind of give me that most of the time. But, um, again, somebody asked me a go-to shutter speed for birds in flight. Uh, same kind of thing here. There's, I mean, that's my go-to setting when there's, but only when there's enough light, uh, when it's darker than that, I'll drop that minimum shutter speed or, you know, maybe I will occasionally go into manual. Um, generally speaking, when I'm photographing birds in the forest and stuff like that, I'm almost always aperture priority. It's very rare that I'll go manual uh, just because I find it way more flexible and I still control it by exposure compensation. But uh, yeah, um, there's no, I, I kind of caution against there ever being a go-to shutter speed for anything because it's all so dependent. It's like, it's like saying what's your go-to ISO and there, I don't think there should be one because it's, it's all dependent upon what you're photographing and what the light is and what the background is and what your intention is and what you want that photo to look like, you know, um, it's all over the place. Like this photo, for example, uh, I shot this at 500th of a second at seven one with this white background. Well, if I wanted this to be a silhouette, I would have photographed this vastly different. My ISO would have been lower. My shutter speed would have been way higher, but it would have been the same scene. So if my intent was totally different, I, my settings and what I chose would be totally different. So uh, I think it's kind of funny. People ask all the time to see the settings when I share photos online, especially on Facebook, and they're always thanking me. And I, I'm kind of like, these settings mean nothing to any other photo, you know? It, like the settings are only applicable to that specific photo in that light with those conditions. Uh, just because I shot... Uh, I don't know here. Let me just scroll through and pick a photo. All right, here we go. Just because I shot this photo 2,500th of a second at F4 at 400 ISO. I, what does that mean to anybody to apply that to anything else in the future? You know, um, I, it doesn't, uh, I shot photos later that day and changed my angle a little bit and changed my settings entirely, uh, or a cloud came over and then I would change my settings entirely on the same set. So like, knowing the settings and what you like, what another photographer shot them at or having a go-to, I think is, I, it, I don't understand. I can't see really how it helps you out a lot. Um, I guess, you know, having a baseline of knowing what you can get sharp photos at is good, which I guess, so there is something to it, I guess. Like for me, knowing like the 500th of a second that I choose as my minimum 
shutter speed for aperture priority when I know there's enough light. That's because I'm just confident that a bird landing on a branch in 90% of any scenario, if I can get 500th of a second on it, I'm going to get a sharp photo for the most part. So I'm really confident in that based on my monopod, my lens and my shooting technique and my history of getting sharp photos. 500th of a second, if I can get there, I'm confident. But that being said, knowing that if there's less light, if, if I notice that 500th of a second, my ISO is running, you know, at 10,000. Well, I'm not going to stay at 500th of a second. I'm going to drop to 250th of a second and get my ISO down to 5,000, which is much more manageable, you know? Um, if it's much brighter out, my camera is going to be on aperture priority usually, and it's automatically going to increase it. So I don't even have to worry about kind of, you know, increasing that shutter speed. It'll just do it on its own. So uh, there's just, I think you have to just think about it a little bit more, but I guess, you know, having that go-to shutter speed can be a good area. I think the go-to shutter speed should be what's what works for you and your gear. Yeah, I really kind of talked around that answer. Sorry. Hopefully I answered it for you. <laughs> and I said I was going to get through these quick, huh? Not quick like that. All right. Um, favorite duck to shoot? Oh, tough. Uh, I will go with... I got to go with the hoodies. The hooded merganzas are a blast. Uh, I spend so much time with them. Uh, they're really nice. Well, we got a lot more questions here. I don't know if I'll be able to get to all these. Let's see. Can I explain how I expose for just the bird? Yes. Um, well... Maybe. <laughs> uh, experience. Um, I know when I point at an image like this, I generally want my meter to tell me that it's probably two stops to three stops underexposed. Um, in this circumstance, it was certainly easier. It was nice because I was shooting with the mirrorless camera and it showed me the exposure. So I was able to just darken it to get it to the level I wanted. But I can easily think back to DSLR days. I would do the same thing with my DSLR. And yeah, I would just, based on experience, uh, I would know that I use the overall metering. The overall metering sees all this black and dark and it needs to, uh, the camera would want to lighten it up. So inherently the camera would see all of that dark and let's see, let me find the raw file here. Let me see if I can illustrate this using Lightroom after the fact. All right. So uh, using overall metering, the camera sees all this dark. This is what the camera wants to do. The camera wants to expose for the majority of what's in that scene. This is what happens to the duck when you do that. Uh, it's going to overexpose. The whites are gone. It's going to be all washed out looking. Not good. So knowing that, um, I want to underexpose. So tell the camera that I need to be darker. So uh, in this case, I was shooting full manual. So um, I was... Uh, let's see. Yeah. Manual. I was use I was choosing my shutter speed, aperture and ISO. So, um, I basically just looked at my meter and watched it get darker. I dialed in the settings to make the meter show the image being about, I don't I don't remember off the top of my head, but I would guess somewhere in the neighborhood of between two and three stops underexposed. So the camera is now going to give me the proper exposure on the duck and then the background goes black. I hope that explains it. You could technically use spot meter, but with spot meter, the spot has to be on the right spot. So think about this duck swimming. I'm laying down in an awkward position. If the spot meter hits this spot, great. Now I have a, a properly exposed white and everything else is going to go dark. Perfect. If the spot meter hits this area, well, this white is in the shade. And that's probably going to overexpose this white in the sun. If the spot meter hits this brown, well, this is a lot darker than the white. So again, probably going to overexpose the white. If that spot meter happened to drift off into the black of the head or even worse, the black of the neck right here that's in shade and black, it's going to, I mean, you're going to end up with an image that looks like that or even worse, you know? Uh, so this is where I think spot metering can be highly accurate, but... Uh, difficult to make accurate because you have to have that spot in the exact right spot, hence spot metering. Uh, and in any case, uh, I lock focus on this and recompose it on the fly. So I'm using the center autofocus point. 
which would be where the spot meter would be. So my spot meter would have been out here and it would have obviously overexposed the image. So it wouldn't work. All right, hope that explains that. Um, let's see. Do I import all of my raw photos into Lightroom and then call from there? Or do I use another app before I bring them into Lightroom? I do import them all right into Lightroom right off the bat and uh, do all the calling there. And there's a lot of reasons and settings you can change to and set to get that to work properly. So again, I'm going to give myself a little bit of a plug here. Uh, head on over to rayhennessy.com, go to the online workshop section, and then look for the online Lightroom course for wildlife. Um, and so you can also just go to learnbirdphotos.com and check that out. Sign up for that. That's going to tell you everything about how I use Lightroom for uh, wildlife photography. And it'll talk about every little tiny setting that I set when I import to make that process happen fast and so that I can cull through the images quickly in Lightroom. Uh, but other people do use other programs. Nothing wrong with that. Everybody's got their own workflow and whatever works for you, I think, is the way to go. Um, very nice live stream. Thank you very much. You'll watch the rest uh, later. That's excellent because it's 1 a.m. in Germany. Good night. Thank you for joining. <laughs> I don't blame you. I'm amazed you stayed up that late. I wouldn't have stayed up that late for me. Um, next one. Absolutely love your podcast. Do I know if there is a wildlife videography version of my podcast? I do not at all. Uh, check out um, the Wild and Exposed podcast. I know... Uh, at least one of their main guys, uh, Michael Mara, do, is mainly like video. He does a ton of video. So I know they talk about it a little bit more on there. All right. Uh, do you mind if I ask what is involved with scouting? Are you just looking to find the species and see where they are, the potential angles to plan a shoot? Uh, yeah, I'm looking for not only species, uh, once I find the species, that's great, but now I need to find good lighting, good background. Um, you know, this whole set of images you're looking at right here was a great example. Uh, when I went there to scout, it was the middle of the day. Uh, I used an app on my phone that shows me the sunrise direction. So while I was there, I was able to see where the sun was going to come. Uh, I was also looking at the backgrounds and I was able to see there's a nice dark background here. There's a nice lighter background in this direction. Uh, so depending on where they are, I'll be able to get a variety of ducks uh, or backgrounds, I should say. Um, I knew that I would be able to get front lit if I shot one angle and then kind of the heavy side light or even back light if I shot another angle. So all of that was there. Uh, I also paid attention to is there a spot that I can get low. Uh, when I scouted, I saw there was a spot I could get low, but then there was some thorny uh, branches and stuff where I wanted to lay. And so when I came back to shoot, I already knew that and I brought little tiny hand clippers with me. So I was able to clip those thorns out of the way and clear them out so I could lay in the right spot. So, you know, just everything like that, you know, I brought a, a waterproof mat to lay on because I knew the area we we're going to lay on is going to be pretty damp uh, and we wanted to stay comfortable in the cold. Um, we brought a camo throw blanket to put over top of ourselves so we could stay hidden from the ducks. So yeah, all these elements are going into scouting and I'm definitely paying attention to, uh, background and light and perspective. Uh, there's a ton of places I go and scout where I find the birds, but I just cannot figure out a great way to consistently make good photos. It's not to say that one can't be made there, but, uh, you know, for most of the time I'm looking for consistency so I can workshop it. All right. Um, am I planning a book? I am not. That would be way too much work. <laughs> but thanks for the interest. Do I keyword, oh, keyword every photo or just the edits? I keyword every photo I keep. Um, so uh, it's so easy to keyword by species, you know? Uh, these are, well, here, these are all hooded mergansers right here like that whole batch right there and there. So look, I would just like select them all and then you just keyword it in one shot, right? Look, you just go right up there, hooded merganser, add it in, hit return, done. Now, every one of those has that keyword hooded merganser on it, just like that. It's super fast. Uh, you know, you can do it in batches. It's not like you have to do each photo individually. And uh, yeah, it's such a simple way to be able to find the photos later. So uh, I highly recommend doing that. Next up, um, with F4, how do I make sure that the whole bird is in focus? Sometimes I get just the face in focus, but their body is not due to depth of field, and that is on 5.6. Uh, I don't care if the whole bird is in focus, not even a little bit. 
Um, if the eye is in focus, that's good enough for me. Uh, look, the tail is out of focus on that one. Um, I can find you some great examples here. Let me go to some of the stuff I shared recently that's really close. Uh, here's a great example. <clears throat> yeah, look, I mean, by the time you get to like this part of the bird right here, the back of the bird there, completely out of focus, you know? Uh, I know I have some other... I I have tons of examples of getting close and not getting the whole subject in focus. And yeah, I don't care even a little tiny bit if the whole bird's in focus or not. There you go. Look at that. Like the, the breast of the bird isn't even in focus because I was so close. Uh, if you care about the entire bird being in focus, then I think your biggest priority is to get the bird to be parallel to the camera like that. Because, uh, look at that, whole bird in focus. Um, this one was taken about the same distance away. Uh, I shot this in the same general spot. Uh, and look, uh, the back wing here already out of focus, the tail way out of focus, you know. Um, so uh, getting the bird parallel, and here is the same species and kind of like the same plant. Again, look, uh, head nice and sharp. The feet are already soft, tail way out of focus. But uh, if I get the bird parallel, to the focal plane, then boom, right there, all in focus. So uh, much better. Uh, on an image like this, when you start getting really close to birds, or even moderately close, I could have shot this at f11, there's still no way I'm getting this whole bird in focus. I could have shot at f20 and not gotten this whole bird in focus. Uh, there's so little depth of field on these um, long telephoto lenses. Uh, I have a great example where I actually show exactly that in a video. Uh, on my online bird photography course. So, uh, so again, just plugging myself here, but um, right here, just go to the online bird photography course. Uh, again, you can find that at, uh, on my website or just go to learnbirdphotos.com. And uh, yeah, I break down all of that depth of field stuff and why I think you're just better off paying attention to the angle of the bird than trying to stop down all the time to, to get the bird in focus because for the most part, you're not going to get that whole bird in focus if you're even remotely close. Uh, if you're really far away, that's a different story. All right. Let's see. Thanks for the compliments, everybody. If I could only photograph one species anywhere in the world, what would it be? Ooh, you know what? It would be any of the species that are in places like um, Antarctica or like the Falklands or something like that, the, the species that have zero fear of humans. I would love, love, love to photograph the birds in those areas and just play with wide angle stuff and, and really just kind of think about photography totally different. Basically, I'd be able to, I feel like I'd be able to apply a lot of my portrait photography skills and the lighting that I learned from that <clears throat> and composition to bird photography because I would be able to use like shorter focal lengths, wider lenses. And I did that all the time with weddings and had a blast with it. Like those were, you know, 35 millimeter was, I would shoot weddings with a 35 and an 85, just prime, you know, um, not entirely, but those were like my favorite lenses to shoot weddings with. And, uh, man, would I love to approach bird photography with the same way, uh, just compositionally having fun, shallow depth of field kind of stuff. Boy, that would be cool. So yeah, uh, no specific species, but just that concept I think would be great. Um, balloons as floats, how stupid, more garbage up, agreed. Yeah, it is sad stuff. All right, guys, uh, I got to say, it's been an hour and a half. I'm starting to lose my voice. <laughs> um, and yeah, I think, uh, I think it's about time to wrap it up. Um, I know there's more questions. I do appreciate it, but since this was a lot of fun and it seems like everybody enjoyed it, there was a thanks. Thanks for all the viewers here. And there are more questions. You know, what? I'll even screenshot these questions and maybe uh, we'll do another one of these again. Um, leave it in the comments if you want to see another one of these shows again, uh, because this was really fun for me and easy. And I would definitely be interested in doing this again. Um, it was great to have you guys here. Uh, I think it was really fun. I think it worked out well that I could kind of bring up photos and show stuff that I was talking about. And that was kind of what I was hoping all along. Let me make sure I get myself in focus there. Um, yeah. So yeah, this would be great to do again. And yeah, just definitely let me know in the comments if you liked it. And I will, like I said, I'll, I'll try my best to keep track of the questions that I didn't get to. And we'll see if we can pick up on the next show and just jump right into that. Um, 
the next time I do it, I think I'll just jump right into the questions and answers because you guys had a ton of stuff. Uh, this was fun. Thank you so much. And with that, I will say goodbye.